Hello, good morning everyone and welcome back to Primary Nature Live where you were joining me as usual live at FSC Juniper Hall. I hope you've all had a really lovely half term and we're able to get outside and have a go at some of the activities we have shown you over the last four episodes. Now for those of you who are new or perhaps have not joined us before, my name is Lou and this is my assistant Angus and today we're going to be visiting Chloe down at Devon, down south at FSC Slatton Lee where she is going to be taking us through some more activities which we could all do whilst out on our walks. But before we hop on down to Devon, first of all, let's see who is joining us today. So first up, well, we've got my little friend, Matthew from Culverston Green Primary. Um, a big good morning to Johnny, Frankie and Alex who are joining us from up in the Lake District. We've also got Joe and his brother, Alfie and the rest of class two at Hawk Church Primary. We also have some students joining us from Keston Primary and Emily in year four has asked for a shout out for Williston C of E in Cheshire. Joining us back again, thank you for joining us again guys, are Tewton Mendip School. It's quite nice when I see like all these names over and over in the chat, it's really nice to have you all back. Um, we're also joined by Chilwef, Chil Chilwell Croft Academy and Norwood Primary in Peterborough. And finally, we've got Giles Brook Primary School. Now, Angus is running away, I've been sent in some more photos of things that you guys have all been making and what you've been up to. So the first thing I thought I would show is from our fabulous flamingo class at, ha at Hatfield Woodhouse Primary, where they have been busy shelter building. So this first shelter that they've sent in is one of those really cool TP style ones, okay? So it's leaning against a tree and it's made out of really, really large sticks. And I really like this shelter because I think if all of your class were there, I reckon lots of you could probably have a go at squeezing into that one and staying nice and warm and dry. So that's the first shelter they've sent us. Now the next shelter, I want you to try and see if you can spot some things. I'm gonna give you five seconds. Please, can you tell me the three things that are hiding in this shelter. So I'm just going to give you five seconds. There's two animals you need to find. So hopefully you were able to spot here in the middle, we've got a little pirate. Over here we've got probably the largest grasshopper I've ever seen and hidden over here we've got a spider as well hiding and I really really like this one it's kind of the other end of the scale it's more of a mini shelter but I think it would be perfect for things like the creatures that you've got in this or my little pair Angus although I think if I put him in that shelter he might just eat it. And the final one they've sent us is a very seasonal shelter so again it's still from the flamingo class They've also built a little mini igloo, which I really like. Now, fun facts about igloo. Did you know that the world's biggest igloo was made in Switzerland and it took 83 days to build and was 10.5 meters high? So that is the same as about a four story building or I'm 150 centimeters, so it's about 10 of me. I can't even like imagine how tall that is. But as well as shelters, I've also been sent in some wonderful pieces of natural art from Eton End School. So here they are, they've sent us in these four. Now something I notice is that one of the students has created Angus munching away at something nice and green. I did show it to him earlier, but he didn't really show much interest, probably because he can't eat it and he's a little bit greedy. So. As in our previous episodes, you can join in in a few different ways. The first way is either through using the resource pack that goes with this episode, which you should have received in your emails. If you haven't received one, what you would need to do is you need to go to our Primary Nature Live website and you can sign up, where we then send you all the resources so you can go back and have a little go. Some of you have also sent in some questions for today's live lesson and I'll try to answer some of those later on towards the end. If you want to get involved, you can do that over in the YouTube live chat and I have a go at answering as much as I can, as I said, towards the end of the lesson. If you would also like a shout out, please tell me your name or your school and I'll try and say as many of those later on as I can as well. Now, in order to use the live chat, you need to make sure you've got a YouTube account. So you need to ask an adult to help you with that. Really important though, and you guys have been really good at this so far, you must treat that YouTube live chat as you would do 
like any kind of thing you would say in a classroom. So we only want questions and shout outs coming in on that chat, okay? So you need to be concentrating on what we are doing today. Now, we've got some of my colleagues joining in the chat too. So they're gonna be keeping an eye on those comments and questions that are coming in and will be helping me answer some of those as we go along. Now, most of you will know that throughout our five lessons, this is our fifth and final one, we're running a competition. In each episode, there'll be a letter of the alphabet somewhere hidden that you need to spot. And if you watch every single episode, you'll collect all of the letters that you need to spell the secret word. At the end of today's episode, I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do to enter the competition so that you can win all of the guides that we have been using in all of our episodes. We've got that one there that I showed you, as well as this adventure pack that we have got. OK, don't forget, though, that as well as our competition, we're also playing our I Spy game where you need to keep your eyes peeled for Chloe's favourite cuddly toy and see if you can spot the FSE logo. Once you spot all three of these things, you can check them off in your welcome pack and make sure you write down that all important letter. So what we're going to do now is we're going to head off down south to go see Chloe on the Devon Close. Over to you, Chloe. Hi, I'm Chloe, one of the tutors here at FSC Slapton in South Devon. I'm here on Slapton Lee National Nature Reserve, which is an area that we manage or look after here at the Field Centre. We're really lucky to have this beautiful environment to explore and to bring our groups to. And we come here all the time. However, one thing I've certainly learned in lockdown is to appreciate the environment around you wherever you live. I've certainly been on lots of walks around my house and I know the paths and roads and lanes like the back of my hand. What we'd like to do today is give you some ideas of activities you could do on a walk in your local area to help you explore nature and discover more about the environment around you. We're going to be using our senses. What can we see around us? But we're also going to be thinking about what we can smell. So the first activity I'd like to show you is making a smelly potion. Now for this, all you're going to need to do is with, take with you on your walk some kind of cup, something like this. And the first thing we're going to do is just fill it with interesting things that we can pick up from the path as we walk along. I'm going to head off in a minute, but before I do, just a couple of things to remember. First of all, we want to look after the environment that we're in. We want to make sure we don't cause any harm to living things. So it's a good idea just to pick up things that are already dead or have already fallen naturally from the flowers, the plants and the trees around you. The other thing is just to remember to be safe. If there's something you're not sure about, don't pick it up. And in particular, mushrooms. Some of those can be poisonous, not all. But if you're not an expert, it's best just to leave them alone. Okay, off we go. lots of different things inside my cup. I've got some leaves, I've got some moss, I've got some lichen, oh just dropped my moss, I've got some bit of mud, some sticks, some decaying leaves. What we need to do now is add some water. Now I'm luckily lucky enough to be right next to Slapton Lee, a big lake, so I'm just going to dip my cup in that. But obviously, if you haven't got a lake or any puddles, you could just bring a bottle of water with you on your walk. So, here we go. Then what we're going to need is a stick to give it a good stir. It's looking pretty good. 
Okay, so now, time to have a good smell. Mmm, I'm not sure I'd want to drink it, but it definitely has a distinctive smell. I'm not sure whether it's good or bad though. What might yours smell like? Compare it with your families. Who's got the best smelling potion? Who's got the worst? And maybe you could think about giving them names, like perfumes. Not sure what I'm going to call mine. I'll have to have a think about it. Now, if I did this again in summer, my potion would probably smell a lot better. It would certainly smell very different. Why do you think that might be? What could I put in it? You guessed it, flowers. There'd be a lot more flowers around. And flowers tend to smell really nice. Now, can you think about why that might be? Hopefully, you said that flowers smell nice to attract pollinators. Things like bees and butterflies. They need to do this to help them reproduce as these animals will help spread their pollen far and wide. That's the reason that they are lots of different colours too to attract those animals. Now at this time of year we're starting to see some early spring flowering plants bringing some colour to the natural world. Here we've got some primroses, there's actually quite a few around and I've also seen some beautiful white snowdrops, some dark pink red campions and even a few daffodils here and there oh, and some yellow lesser celandines. So maybe on your next walk you could look for some early signs of spring too. Even on a grey day like this, at the time of year when there aren't too many flowers about, there are still plenty of colours in nature that we can observe. And here's a really fun game you can play with your family on your walk to try and identify them. One person shouts out a colour and everybody else has to race off to try and find it. There's no need to bring it back, you could just stand by it. Remember, we want to make sure we're looking after the environment we're in and not harming living things. And anyway, some things might be too heavy or difficult to move. Why don't you have a go now? Have a look at the woodland behind me and I'll call out some colours. See if you can find them. something bluey green. Orange? Now obviously there's loads of green. How many different shades of green can you count? Another game we could play to explore colour in nature is woolly worms and in your resource pack there are the instructions on how to play this. What I've got here is some coloured wool cut up into little worms and what I'm going to do is go spread them out on the grass behind me and then you can have a go at trying to find them again. you have a go at setting up that game yourself. One person could lay out all the worms and everybody else can race around trying to find the most. You could even pause after a minute or so and see which colours most people have found first. Then carry on after another minute what colours do you start to find and so on. Why is it that some colours are easier to spot than others? Well it's all about camouflage. Using colour or patterns to blend in with your surroundings. Now, Different organisms have different abilities to do this and it helps them to hide from predators but it also helps predators to sneak up on their prey. So that's almost it for me for now. I hope you enjoy having a go at some of those activities with your family on your next walk. Um, I'll be back later to show you some craft activities that you can do with some items you might collect on a walk. I've brought a plastic bag with me, so I'm just going to go and collect a few twigs, leaves and anything else interesting that I can find. And I'll show you what we can do with those later. 
Bye for now. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Chloe. Now, whilst Chloe was talking about how to make smelly potions, I really quickly ran outside to the Juniper Hall Herb Garden and made my own one, which I've got here. Okay, so in my smelly potion, I have got some rosemary, some mint, some thyme and some sage. And actually, if I give it a bit of a swirl, I'm actually really surprised of how lovely it smells. It's quite fragrant. The mint and the rosemary are really, really strong. Hmm. So as Chloe said, once you have made your smelly potions, please, please, please do not drink them as you don't know what if what's inside them is safe, but definitely give them a good smell and have a go at describing them. And as she said, maybe give them a name. Now, something else that Chloe mentioned is how animals may use colour to help them camouflage or to help them hide. I wonder if you could tell me one animal in the chat box that perhaps uses colour to camouflage itself. Whilst you're having a little think about what animal may do that, I have, as per usual, my trusty assistant Angus here as my example. Now, when Angus is scared by something or if he gets in a grump with me, what he will do is he retracts his head and his arms, his legs and his tail, and they all go inside his shell. Now, when he does this, I'm gonna turn him around, which he won't like very much, from above, all he looks like is a bit of a rock okay and that is his way of hiding from any predators in particular birds that might be circling from above now as i have mentioned in previous videos angus is a russian horsefield tortoise and his natural habitat is really really dry quite rocky okay and probably the only vegetation that would be there is some grass and some weeds so as a result his coloring so this kind of like greeny sandy color and this kind of like rocky color means that if he needs to hide, he is really, really good at being able to do that. What do you reckon? Not so good here in the UK though, is it really? So I'll pop him back down. Something else that Chloe was talking about is spring. Now I'm so excited that spring is on the way and I've been definitely noticing some changes just like the ones that Chloe pointed out. On Saturday, I went for a really lovely long walk and I saw my first bright purple crocus. And in my garden, I've seen the starts of loads of bluebells starting to grow. The other thing I saw yesterday that really, really excited me was my first bumblebee of the year. Now, bumblebees are not something to be frightened of. Actually, at this time of year, they're incredibly clumsy as they've just woken up from their winter slumber and are bumbling around looking for some nectar to eat so they can recharge and refuel to allow them to start building their nest for next year. Despite myself actually being really allergic to bee and wasp stings, I absolutely love bumblebees as they're just big balls of friendly fluff and they're definitely not out there to hurt you. So if you see them flying around, don't be scared or try to hurt them. Maybe just sit and watch them and see where they go and perhaps what they are up to. As you may remember from some of the previous episodes, we've also been talking a little bit about climate change. As this is our last episode together, I thought it'd be good if we could come up with some ideas of what little changes you could do in your own home to help combat climate change. We can all do really small things to help reduce our carbon footprint. So for example, since lockdown, something that I've tried to do is I've tried to drive less. Um, I've been doing things like go, walking to the shops much more and our shops here are perhaps a little bit far away. So if I've not got the time, I might cycle in. This means that there is less carbon being released and I definitely get a little bit fitter as well. The other thing I do is during these winter months, I've always made sure that I put on an extra jumper rather than just turning up the heating. And this means that I'm using much less electricity at home. So what would be good is you, if you could all have a little think about what you and your family could do to reduce your carbon footprint at home. There is a space in your welcome pack to fill this in or let us know in the YouTube chat what things you could do or what things you do already. So whilst you're typing those in, I do have time for a quick round of shout outs. So we are joined by year six from Hounslow Heath Junior School. 
We've got St Barnabas Primary in Tunbridge Wells. Oh, so actually not too far from us here. Um, we've got Year Thor at Bootham Junior School. Well, you guys are back. That's a name I've seen before. Um, hello to Year Four from Wordsworth Primary. We've also got Year Three from Russell Hall Primary School and Year Five at St Monica's Catholic Primary School. And finally, all the way from Bristol, we're joined by St Martin's class at St Mary's Catholic. So I'll do one more shout out round later on and don't forget I'm going to be answering all of your questions but for now we're going to head back over to Chloe where she has one final activity for us. So I'm back from my walk and I'm out in the garden ready to make some ice mobiles. So what you're going to need for this is a bowl or a dish, maybe a cake tin, especially if you've got one of those flexible ones, they work really, really well. Or a um, plastic tub that's had um, fruit in or food, um, just make sure it hasn't got any holes in the bottom because you're going to fill it with water. So you're going to need a jug of water. We're also going to need some string, some scissors, and the things that you collected on your walk. So here's my bag full of bits. I collected a fern frond, we've got some leaves, I've got a pine cone, and um, some twigs with some nice lichen on, um, and a few other bits. The other thing you need to do is make some space in your freezer big enough for your dish. So, how do we go about this? Well, first things first, pour some water into your dish. Don't fill it all the way to the top though, because what might happen to that water as it freezes? Well, it's going to expand. So we don't want to fill it right to the top of our dish. We want to give it space to do so. Once you've done that, you're going to take some of the things that you've collected on your walk and just drop them into the dish to make a nice pattern. You probably notice that some of the things you've collected will float and some of the things you've collected will sink. Pine cone certainly sinks. So arrange a few little bits in your bowl. So there we go. Then what you need to do is take some string and cut a bit that's going to be long enough to loop around the branch of a tree or wherever, wherever you might like to hang your mobile. So we'll loop it and we'll fold it in half and then you're going to put the looped end into your bowl. Okay, you might need to sort of just wedge it under one of the twigs or a leaf or something. Your two loose ends are going to dangle out. And that's it ready to go or rather ready to go put in the freezer so I'm going to go do that with this one now and grab out some that I made yesterday which should be ready and here they are let's move these out of the way so here are a few that I made yesterday that one in a minute um so here's one in one of those flexible cake tins so what we're going to do is flip them out and there we go all ready to hang up in the tree or wherever else also made a slightly different shaped one yeah not sure what that was There we go. And finally, got a little one here, but just to give you another idea, you could put some bird seed in with your mobile too. So this one has just got some bird seed frozen in for the birds to have a little feast on um, as it starts to melt. So I'm going to have a go at hanging these up in a tree now, and I'll show you what they look like. So here are the finished ice mobiles hanging in a tree. 
and I hope you all agree that they look pretty cool. Um, even Boris the cat has come to have a look actually. Boris, what do you think? Hmm, seems a bit unimpressed actually. But hopefully you like them and you'll have a go at making some at home. So that's pretty much it for me down here at Slapton. I really hope you do enjoy having a go at some of the activities we've shown you. Um, so take care, stay safe um, and have fun exploring your local area. Um, one last thing though, I've got a pine cone left. So Lou, do you want to have a go at using it in your ice mobile? Ah, oh, thanks very much for the pine cone, Chloe. I think later I'm definitely going to have a go at making some of those ice sculptures. Although today here at Juniper it is actually quite warm. It's quite windy, but very warm. So I don't know how long the ice sculpture might stay, but I definitely like the idea of putting some bird seed in it for all those birds that are flying around out there. Thank you very much. Now I've had a little look at some of your um, comments about animals that can camouflage and some of my favourites have been the frog. They're really good at camouflaging with all things like rocks and things around um, the pond. We've got things like oh, chameleons and octopus. They do a very similar thing. They can change the colour of their outer layer of like skin so that they can blend in with the things that are around them. Octopus in particular can, if it's angry or if it's scared, it will also change colour to perhaps frighten things off as well. So that's, I like those ones, those are good ones. Um, lizards as well. Did you all know that here in the UK, we do actually have our own lizards, okay? We've got things like common lizards. And quite often, if you look very carefully, you might see them sat on the walls basking. But because as you've all pointed out, they're really good at camouflaging. Sometimes it's really hard to see them. The same with grass snakes they blend in really well as well. We've got a couple more exotic ones here. We've got a bark spider. Ooh, I've not heard of that one before. Um, stick insects. And we've got snow rabbit and snow fox as well. I suppose they're all white all over, aren't they? So it's hard to find them in the snow. Right then, we've got time for a final round of shout outs. So we've got Manor Primary School from Reading. We've got a uh, reception class from Tom St. Thomas More School. Hello over in Colchester. And we've got Tyso Primary as well. Uh, Perrymount Primary, that's another school name I recognise. I think you guys have joined in all the episodes as well. So you guys are back as well as Hope Community School. Hello, good morning. And we've also got St. Luke's Horsall Primary and their year five class as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Us. What I'm going to do now is have a go at answering some of the questions you've sent in. Now, some of you have been sending in lots of questions about wasps, in particular, what eats them. Now, I know a lot of you probably find wasps very, very annoying, especially in late summer when they're trying to like steal your food or hovering around your fizzy drinks. But wasps are actually a really important part of the food chain. Now, wasps are great at eating other insects that we consider to be pests, like some moths and some beetles. But in turn, they themselves are then eaten by other animals like birds and even some of our native bat species. So without wasps, we could be overrun with beetles eating all of our crops and our bats and birds would have even less food to find. They are so, wasps themselves though are so good at their job of eating other pests that places like the National Trust are starting to introduce certain parasitic wasps to places like the birthplace of Anne Boleyn to stop all the clove moths from munching at all the fabric they have in the house. So whilst they are annoying, wasps are incredibly useful to us, okay? Now we've got another question, which is what is my favourite sign of spring? Um, so for me personally, it has to be something that is known as the dawn chorus. So the dawn chorus is where all the birds start to come out and wake up and sing as the sun starts to rise in the morning. And usually the dawn chorus will start off with like the chirps or the songs of the robin or of the blackbird. Now, as spring progresses, more and more birds join in as they start to migrate over to us. And by the time we get to Dawn Chorus Day, which is the first Sunday in May, I think, they are so loud and I love getting up to hear them all. It just makes me really happy in the morning. Okay, the final thing I'm going to answer is about this little troublemaker down here who is trying to escape for the entire video. And one question is why are tortoises so slow? Now, actually, surprisingly, tortoises aren't really that slow. If I put Angus down to run around the house, because at the moment it's still too cold to put him outside, 
if I put him down to run around inside, I might look up at something and look back down and he will be gone. Now, tortoises are quite often quite slow because they are cold blooded. That means that their blood that they have in their system doesn't keep them at a nice regular temperature like us as humans. So when they're really, really cold, they don't have a lot of energy and they find it really hard to move around. But if you get them nice and warm and well fed, like Angus is right now, they will move much quicker than you expect. Another reason is if you think about our bigger tortoises, perhaps like the giant ones we find um, on the Galapagos Islands, imagine having to carry around those huge shells all day, every day. If you carried a big rucksack like that, I think you might all move a bit slower as well. Lots of you have been asking again what kind of things Angus likes to eat. Well, Angus, because he is a Russian horsefield tortoise, he eats an entire diet based off of weeds. Um, in the winter, when there aren't any weeds around, I have to feed him things like kale. But in the spring and in the summer, I can go out and pick him things like dandelions and plantain. But the different species of tortoise mean that they can eat different things. So some tortoises can eat fruit. Angus can't eat any fruit. It's like us eating chocolate and sweets. It's not very good for him at all. And others can even eat small bugs and things like that. OK, so it just depends on the tortoise. He looks like he's hungry and he could probably do with some more to eat. So I'm just going to pop him down for a second. Um, so although this is our last session, I would still love to see all of the things that you have made. So as we have done before, you can post those on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram with the hashtag Primary Nature Live. And then if you follow the FSC on social media, you might see some of your creations that we retweet or that we share. But please make sure you get an adult to help you with this. The information you need for this will be shown at the end. Thank you so much for joining us over the last five episodes of Primary Nature Live. It's been brilliant to see you all engage with the outdoors. A huge thank you to Joe, Kaylee, Phil, Amber and James and Chloe for presenting the activities for us and as well as all the people behind the scenes that you and YouTube cannot see. Now, I know lots of you are sat around waiting for me telling you how you can enter the competition. So to enter the competition, to remember, you need to have all five letters from all the previous episodes, which you need to rearrange to spell out a word that, as a little hint, has something to do with nature. What we then would like you to do is to get an adult to help you and email us at our Primary Nature Live email that will appear at the end of this video. And if you could please email us the secret word that you've worked out, your name, Angus, stop it, and your name. And what we will do is we will then pick a winner at random and we will announce it on Twitter tomorrow as well as email you back, okay? Um, as you all know that these live lessons have been put on for free, so if you would like to make a donation to the FSC as a charity, please head over to our website where you can find out how to do that there. So in a moment, we're going to be showing you a slideshow of some of our favourite things you've been sending in. But from Angus and from me, thank you so much for all your hard work and for joining us. Bye! <laughs>